very well known in the MSR community. Uh, Charles Forsberg will be speaking today about integrated research project salt loop radiation that's happening at MIT. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as you probably may or may not know, MIT has done a, done a number of capsule of radiations of salt, and we're going to the next step, that is to put in a salt loop with flowing salt under a radiation. Uh, the partners uh, with MIT are North Carolina State University, the University of California at Berkeley, and Oak Ridge National Laboratory. There are multiple technologies dependent upon salt technologies. We have a series of technologies that use clean fluoride salts, uh, the Kairos Power FHR, clean salt uh, HTGR fuel, uh, the Commonwealth Fusion uh, Arc concept, a fusion reactor with a uh, flybe salt uh, blanket, and Multex, which is an interesting combination of chloride salt in tubes and a fluoride salt uh, coolant. Second, of course, we have fuel in fluoride salts, the classical molten salt reactors. In addition, the Europeans have been examining a molten fluoride salt fast reactor. Uh, the newest collection of options for the salt family are the chloride salts, where we have work on molten chloride fast reactors, mostly by TerraPower, and also work on fuel salt in tubes with clean salt coolant by Moltex. I'd like to clearly state what our project goals are. Uh, the first is to design, build, and test a general purpose, instrumented, molten salt loop at the MIT reactor where flowing salt is irradiated by neutrons with temperature variations around the loop to duplicate conditions in a salt reactor. It's to provide near-term capabilities, but it has another important goal. Uh, provide the learning experience for future loops at ATR, VTR, and university reactors. And I think in the long run, that may be the most important because if we go very far down this molten salt path, uh, we're gonna need multiple loops with different capabilities and different reactors. Uh, second, I provide experimental data on tritium and fission product retention, diffusion, and transport properties. Third, I provide an experimental test bed for chemistry control, salt cleanup, tritium control, and instrumentation. And of course, this involves strong interactions with industry and the national labs. Brief note on who's doing what. Uh, we're at MIT, obviously, designing and building the loop. Uh, North Carolina State is uh, going to develop, design, build, and test an off-gas sensor system capable of measuring tritium, fission products, and actinides at temperature. Could be an interesting sensor system. The University of California at Berkeley is to develop, design, build instrumentation for measurement and control of redox salt chemistry. And Oak Ridge National Lab is supporting us in a variety of different ways. I'm going to first describe what we're doing and then go to the other sites one by one. This is in the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering in the MIT Reactor Laboratory. MIT has initiated design and construction of a salt loop at the MIT reactor. The MIT reactor is a six megawatt reactor. It operates 24 seven. Typically it operates for about a thousand hours. Then it stops to refuel and put in new experiments and go on for the next thousand hour irradiation. What we're proposing is a forced circulation loop in the MIT reactor. Now in the picture, the core of the reactor is shown in blue. That's the small little loose item. Uh, next to it is a larger area, a one cubic meter volume where the salt experiments will be. And I'll provide more of that a little bit later in the talk. The MIT facility enables loop design with fissile materials. And what I show in the picture on the right is the system we have. On the far right, we have the reactor core as outlined. Uh, it sends neutrons through a high enriched uh, uranium booster that uh, turns thermal neutrons into fast to a fission spectrum. Uh, that booster actually is a set of fuel assemblies uh, that are used in the MIT reactor. The neutrons from that go into our cubic meter facility, whereas the beam target area where the salt, uh, salt uh, system will be. A couple of key items, the loop is outside the reactor that partly decouples the reactor neutronics from the loop. And that's important <laughs> because it avoids large feedback effects and enables the use of fissile materials in the loop. One has to, be, has to meet a certain safety criteria for these kinds of experiments. 
And last, which is most important, one can adjust fissile and lithium-6 content to the fuel to uh, get desired salt behavior. Uh, lithium uh, tritium pre production is particularly easy. A little more lithium-6 in our salt and we'll get as much tritium as we will ever want. <laughs> that's the easy, that's the really easy part. Uh, brief description of the parameters. Uh, the basic system is about two meters high, a meter in each direction. We're going to make it out of 316 stainless steel. Uh, the main tubing will be a half an inch in size. Uh, the salt constituents will be either Flynac or Fly. That requires some explanation. Flynac is used in non-neutron irradiation experiments to shake down the loop and the equipment. In the actual experiments under neutron irradiation, we use Fly salt. Uh, the salt volume in the system is about 10 liters. We have an operating temperature up to 700 C, although we may be able on short transients to go to 750 C. Uh, the salt velocity will be between 0 0.01 and 2 meters a second. Uh, that covers the FHR design range and many other, but not all, designs. The temperature gradient will be up to 100 C and continuous operation up to 1,000 hours, which of course is the standard time the MIT reactor runs on a particular set of experiments. So that's sort of controlled by the larger operations of, of the reactor. Important observation. MIT has uh, developed the design specification and technical requirements for two forced flow salt loops. These loops will be fairly similar to each other. One is a, a loop in the laboratory with Flynac salt, where we do our learning and testing of equipment be it instrumentation, valves, pumps, whatever you may uh, think about, we test it outside the reactor environment under fairly realistic conditions, that is full temperature, obviously, uh, before we put it into the second loop that is in the reactor and sees the full neutron flux. So in effect, we're building two, two loops, one of them, uh, Flynac, tear it apart, put it back together, watch things break, tear it apart, put it back together, and after they stop breaking very often, <laughs> we then move uh, to the second loop uh, with lessons learned from the first loop. So it's a, it's a two, two loops are actually being, being built. Uh, this shows a schematic of the force flow system. It's divided into two parts. On the right, there is the loop system. Uh, this provides the pumps, the heaters, the cooling systems, instrumentation control systems. And this is, becomes ultimately the permanent part of the flow loop system. This is what, if you use this for many, many years, it's the part that stays there. On the left is the section that goes in and sees the neutron flux. It's the test section. And it is expected to be regularly replaced, torn apart, new replacements put in, depending upon the goals. And it depends on objectives, whether we're looking at coupon component or sensor testing, we're looking at the effects of thermal gradient, uh, radiating targets, tritium removal, chemistry mon monitoring or control. The key thing is we've divided the system into two parts, the, the operations part that hopefully will not see very many changes over the years, and then the test section, which, well, it comes and it goes with the particular goals in mind. Uh, this uh, picture here is actually of the dry test facility. We have uh, component test facilities for various things. Uh, this one is a, is a beginning operation. So the low pressure argon, uh, it'll go up to high, te high temperatures. And the initial uh, testing is to focusing on insulation and candidate fittings. And of course, in a real test loop with real instrumentation where you're taking out <laughs> instrumentation and putting it back in, you don't want to cut apart the whole system and, and glue it, uh, have to weld it back together. You're going to have to think about how you maintain this system over a long period of time and that means we would certainly like to go to uh, couplings, which means you have fittings, which means, of course, you have to go through a rather elaborate testing procedure to uh, get to something that will actually be reliable in this particular environment. It's part of the learning curve. Uh, we're building support salt handling systems. We're expanding our capability to have three furnaces and two glove boxes. Uh, one is for clean salt, and of course the other is for irradiated salt. And we show some of the components that have, have arrived most recently. Uh, now, work is underway to prepare the cubic meter reactor facility. This facility hasn't been used for some time, 
And as you can guess what happens in that case, <laughs> nothing, nothing's been removed from the last experiment. So the first uh, activity of beginning is the removal and relocation of previous experiments and support equipment. And we'll be doing some repairs to the neutron uh, shutter system. This is a, a shutter that can cut off the neutron flux from the reactor to the experiment. We don't have to run the experiment for a thousand hours. We can run it for 10 hours, lower the neutron shutter and shut down the neutron flux. Uh, we of course have to do some allocation of additional power, cooling and ventilation for the experiments. And we're in the planning stage for removal of the high activity components that were previously in there, uh, neutron filters, and of course, reloading of the HEU uh, booster elements. With that, I'd like to now turn to what's being done at North Carolina uh, State. Professor Hawari will provide a more detailed description in about 20 minutes. And for that reason, I'm just going to give a very short introduction of what North Carolina State is doing in the context of the Loop Project. He's going to provide the real details. Uh, North Carolina State University is developing an off-gas monitoring system. And the goal is to measure the full molten salt reactor fission product spectrum with off-gases between 600 and 700 C. And the initial testing is going to be done at the North Carolina State uh, Pulsar reactor. And it's a very complicated piece of instrument, which I will leave uh, for further discussions later in this session. Uh, with this, uh, North Carolina State University is building an off-gas sensor system and the off-gas source. This will be a capsule source located next to the reactor. It gets irradiated with whatever molten materials are in the capsule. Uh, the facility design is in the vent stage and equipment acquisition is underway for this extreme environment in pool irradiation facility. And again, this will be further discussed in about 20 to 25 minutes. And what the University of California at Berkeley is doing and what Professor Scarlett and her team is doing in the Department of Nuclear Engineering. Uh, UC Berkeley is developing chemical control strategies. Now, I'd like to stop at a moment and emphasize something here. Redox chemistry control determines corrosion rates and what fission products are metals versus fluoride salts. Uh, as I mentioned, we did earlier a number of capsule irradiations. Some were not so successful, some were very successful. One of the things that's come out from our experience and other experience is the real need to measure redox, that is chemical conditions, act and during irradiation. It's hard to do, but you want online monitors, online sensors, because conditions can change. And if you just measure before and after the experiment, you're not going to see what the experiment or the, the sample actually saw. This is a real need to have online redox control, not only for good experiments, but also when you get to building a power plant, you really have to know what's going on. This is similar to measuring the pH in a light water reactor. If you don't know the water chemistry, you're in trouble. You're going to corrode stuff. In a molten salt reactor, if you don't know the salt chemistry, you're going to have the same problem. So it's really important. Um, of course, they're going to be doing tritium and fission product transport experiments, uh, develop uh, redox measurement probes for the loop, and development of a redox control strategy. The far right, we see an electrochemical probe for standard uh, molten salt chemical cell. Uh, the probe will be inserted into the MIT irradiation loop. So that's the, the operational type sensor. In addition to their developing uh, thin film sensors for high throughput uh, electrochemical experimentation. With this, they're developing new capabilities at Berkeley, the most important is the development of a, and recent commissioning of a glove box train for experiments with irradiated materials that includes irradiated carbon, uh, beryllium, and tritium. And that's shown in the central picture associated with that are a wide variety of instrument systems to be able to analyze the samples and determine what is happening. Well, in parallel to uh, their building facilities, they've also put together a set of reviews on hydrogen, uh, salt chemistry and graphite chemistry, and those are available if any of you have an interest in the uh, in the details of where we currently stand in our understanding and the path going forward. Now, ORNL is supporting the project based on experience with out of uh, reactor loops. They've uh, been designing and operating multiple loops, including force loops, and that experience is being used by us. Now, I'm I'm not going to go any further into detail because tomorrow Ken Robb's going to have a session where he describes what he's been doing and he's our contact in ORNL and I wouldn't want to spoil what he's, what he's about to say. 
We're designing and building an instrumented salt flow loop. Uh, neutron irradiation, initially clean flibe salt, then later on the option of fissile materials, uh, variable temperature around the loop. Uh, this is being designed as a long-term facility for change out of experiments with lessons learned for future DOE and university salt loops. Now, I think that's a really important point to emphasize because if we're really going to develop salt reactors, we're going to need more than one loop. And we're going to need loops with very, very different capabilities, which implies they're going to get built in very different reactors. Uh, last, uh, the major procurements are all on order, and there's a lot of cold testing of uh, subsystems that is underway. And with that, I will stop and open the, the floor to see if there are any questions that, I can, that I hopefully I can answer. Thank you. Your presentation was excellent. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing in a, a loop, in a radiation loop, that'll, that'll definitely be some impactful science. You did have a question in the chat. Uh, during your learning phase, did you manage to qualify some components such as valves or gaskets that could be used in the development of reactors? Well, I suspect our valves are too small, but we will certainly be qualifying things like uh, how to take instrument probes in and out. And in a real reactor, you have instrument probes to watch the salt chemistry. So some of it will be applicable, commercially applicable, because I mean, if you're going to put a sensor in, it's going to be the same sensor, hopefully, to commercial applications. Uh, but I suspect that any valve in a commercial system is going to be a great deal larger than ours, except for maybe a sample valve. So sample valves, yes, but I'm not sure anything much larger than, uh, than a sample valve for, for a power reactor. Uh, you did discuss like some quick connect options um, and as well as the clamping options for your instrumentation. Um, and that was for your dry facility. Will you be using similar, the same components? Yes, you know, yes, this is all for qualification to use in the actual, everything we're doing is to qualify stuff to put into the real system with the real salt with neutron irradiation. We have lots of experience base and the bottom line is you should never put untested components in an irradiated loop, there will be enough failure modes, never mind everything else. You, you really, if you're going to have any chance of success, you really have to check everything out at temperature outside the loop before you put it in the radiation field. I wish that wasn't true. Well, welcome to the real world. That's just how the real world runs. <laughs> <laughs> Ed from Elysium, excellent presentation. Great to hear someone acknowledge the importance of redox. <laughs> You said you will be monitoring the redox. Will there also be active redox control or is that planned for much later experiments? Yes, we plan to have active redox control, but of course the monitoring will determine whether the active redox control is doing really what we think it's doing. <laughs> they're, they're, they're part and parcel, you're gonna have both. We've done enough experiments without redox control to know that's a really bad idea. On that same comment about, you know, Charles being well known, I, I just found out that we have some MSRE veterans on the call. Bob Hightower and Sid Ball are both in the audience. So I, I guess that's a reflection that once we all get into molten salt, it's hard to get away. Well, it may, it, it may also reflect the fact that uh, I worked for 30 years at Oak Ridge and now have a retirement job at MIT. <laughs> so I'm quite familiar with uh, a lot of the staff at ORNL. Well, thank you again for your presentation today. It's very exciting to see these irradiation experiments that are happening. I think that's going to be so impactful uh, as an experimentalist myself. You know, we, we're interested in the pre and post radiation examination of these salts.